Hi, good evening, everyone. I think it's time. We can go ahead and get started. Dr. Debbie, I will let you allow uh, to start speaking. You're muted. Open. Okay. So hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. We have a really exciting webinar from the SSAT Research Committee on Artificial Intelligence. I would like to introduce my esteemed co-moderator, uh, Dr. Pooja Katan. She is a surgical scientist at Sheikh Shaboud uh, Medical City in Abu Dhabi. Uh, Dr. Katan is a robotic thoracic surgical scientist with a passion for innovation and research. Her research is focused on developing cost-effective screening strategies for lung and esophageal cancers. She has a keen interest in applying AI and machine learning to understand the pathophysiology of cancer and understand the tumor response to immuno and chemo radiotherapy. Thank you. And I'll do the same for Dr. Keller. Uh, Dr. Deborah Keller is a robotic colorectal surgeon, scientist at PACT Hartford Healthcare in Connecticut, and she's a very fresh professor of surgery at University of Strasbourg, Ircard in France. She's passionate about innovation, education, and research. Her mission is to improve the quality, safety, and efficiency of healthcare delivery through the integration of robotic surgery, innovation, and data science. Lastly, I want to thank Ms. Beverly Hendry. She's an administrative assistant from the SSAT headquarters, as well as our AV personnel. She's the backbone of our webinars, and she's worked tirelessly to make this webinar happen today. So thank you, Beverly. And without further ado, we'll introduce our speakers and start a webinar. Yes, so we have an amazing lineup today. Our first speaker is gonna be Dr. Daniel Hashimoto. Dr. Hashimoto is an assistant professor of surgery in computer and information science at University of Pennsylvania, as well as the director of Penn's Picasso Lab. He's a faculty member in the General Robotic, Automation, Sensing, and Perception Lab at Penn Engineering and a senior fellow in the Institute for Biomedical Informatics. As a foregut surgeon, he has a keen interest in flexible endoscopy, and he's going to be talking on the applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning in medicine. We'll throw it over to you now, Dan. Thank you so much, Dr. Keller, Dr. Katan, and uh, the SSAT for the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is artificial intelligence. And uh, really, I think just to sort of set the tone for the rest of the webinar, really just covering some of the basic terminology that gets used in AI and machine learning and that whole alphabet soup of different acronyms that we're seeing pop up more and more, not just in the lay press, but also in our academic literature. So there are lots of different definitions of artificial intelligence and machine learning out there. It's not to say that any one of them is the only right definition, um, but just to sort of, everybody's on the same page. When we talk about AI for the next hour, it's really just describing any sufficiently complex software that can mimic human behavior on some task. And that mimic component becomes key. It's not necessarily fully replicating that. And we'll get to a little bit of that later. Machine learning is a, sort of a subset of artificial intelligence. It's a set of tools or the study of a set of tools that allows machines to learn and make predictions based on recognizing patterns. So really it's about algorithms that learn from data and that update from that data to which they're exposed. And if you were to put that on a Venn diagram to better understand how these terms kind of relate to one another, uh, you see that AI is almost like this parent category into which machine learning falls. And then within machine learning, in the green, you have different strategies of learning, supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement learning being three of the most common that we see today in medicine. And then other types of tools like neural networks or a subset of neural networks, deep learning. And when we think about what defines machine learning, there's been changes into how we've conceptualized machine learning overall. Uh, early machine learning, uh, going back to the 90s, even, even before that, was really around feature engineering. So it's as a programmer, as an engineer, you would, quote unquote, handcraft features that you would want an algorithm to look for. So a very basic example, I want a machine learning model to identify cats and dogs uh, what is a cat to me? Well, it's got pointy ears, it's got whiskers, maybe it's got uh, little stripes on it. I want my algorithm to look for those types of features, model the data, and then generate an output to tell me, am I looking at a dog or am I looking at a cat? 
that underwent a big paradigm shift in the early 2010s when deep learning really came into fashion. And that really involved not the handcrafted engineering that a program would have to say, look for this, look for that. It's let's give machines a lot of data and allow machines to automatically determine which features are the best to use to seek a certain output. And so we'll go over a couple of examples uh, shortly that are less about dogs and cats and maybe more about surgical examples. Within that, there are other terms when we think about what are the goals of using these different learning strategies. So in supervised learning, which is where you're actually giving labeled data to an algorithm, you're often trying to achieve one of two basic problems. Either you're classifying, right? Is this a tumor? Is this not a tumor? Will this patient survive or not survive an operation? Or you're trying to regress that data to try to predict, well, how many days out can you go before you get a complication? How many years do you have disease-free survival, et cetera? In unsupervised learning, where there aren't exactly labels that you're specifically trying to replicate, you're just trying to better understand the data, you can have different approaches to thinking about, well, are you trying to cluster the data? Are you trying to find associations between data? And reinforcement learning, I'll give you a couple of examples of those shortly. When we think about more surgical type examples in an application of artificial intelligence known as computer vision, which is machine understanding of images and videos, you get three basic types of problems that you're trying to solve. On the left, you're looking at classification, which is given an image, can I classify what's in it? So what type of tool is that? What type of organ are we looking at? Or you may want to achieve detection. Where in the image is a grasper? Where in the image is the clipper? Or you can get even more specific than that and say, well, no, I want to segment structures within an image. So tell me exactly the boundaries of that grasper, the, exactly the boundaries of that hook. And these types of problems are typically solved by using supervised learning. So we touched briefly on that where you have labels. Well, here's sort of a more surgical type example. A human has to first label training data. So in this example, well, these pictures here are all pictures of gallbladders. You feed that to the algorithm. The algorithm can then infer from that training data what are features that are most representative of gallbladders, such that when you give it unlabeled data, it can then say, well, this is a gallbladder, but this is not. Right? So again, this here becomes a classification type of problem. In unsupervised learning, again, you're pulling from that unlabeled data and trying to either find associations or cluster like with like. And then a human has to interpret that to give it some meaning. So you may give it a handful of images to do training with. And then as it processes that data, it can split that up and say, well, these images are alike. As a human, I might look at that and say, well, there's no bleeding in those images. And that bottom image is separate as a different class. Oh, if I look at that, that looks like there's some bleeding. So maybe it's splitting things up by bleeding and not bleeding. But in, there's no inherent knowledge of the algorithm in these types of unsuper, purely unsupervised problems that would suggest it, quote unquote, knows what bleeding is. Reinforcement learning is really, for us who have been sort of trained in the biology paradigm, operant conditioning, right? So it's the rat that pushes the lever to get food or avoids the lever if it gets shocked. And it's the same type of thing for machines. It gets a series of rewards and punishments that it has to sort of stumble through to determine the rules of the quote unquote game or scenario into which it's placed. And this is the type of technique that was used with great success in applications like chess or in Go, where now where it's essentially impossible for humans to beat these types of machines because they've played themselves so many times and optimized for winning strategy. A lot of these types of learning strategies have been based on real advances that have been made in neural networks over the last 13 years or so. Neural networks are so named because they're inspired by the neurons that we learned about in neuroscience. So there are individual computational units called neurons. They're basically can take in data, run them through some type of activation function, whether it's sigmoidal or otherwise, and then generate an output. And if you put these neurons into series or into different layers, 
they can then do more and more complex types of analyses. So it can take complex data, for example, in, in an anesthesia environment and say, well, let me take into account different elements of EEG, heart rate variability, the map, and then based off of a, based, a certain function that's programmed into the algorithm, well, I can determine for you as a machine, is this patient awake or is this patient asleep? Now, a neural network at its basic level is three layers like this, but in deep learning, what we see is continuing layers. I mean, now we're sort of in the hundreds or thousands of layers, depending on what type of algorithm you want to accomplish. And this allows you to get more and more complex analyses out of this. What's important in all this is not just understanding what are the differences in these types of learning strategies, but how do you evaluate deep learning problems or AI problems overall? Now, as clinicians, we're often exposed to sort of a handful of metrics that we become familiar with. Things like sensitivity or area under the receiver operating curve. What's the average precision of a problem? Specificity, right? Uh, but the problem is these metrics often have downsides. So a very common thing that we see in medicine is the area under the receiver operating curve. And yet the problem with that is that the false negative can really sort of mess you up. If you have a class imbalance problem where you have a lot of false negatives, any changes to your positives are actually not gonna be as well reflected. And that may artificially influence the, the overall number that you're using to evaluate the performance of an algorithm. To give maybe a more concrete example that moves away from area under the receiver operating curve is an example of a chest X-ray, right? So let's say somebody's trying to sell you a chest X-ray algorithm that automatically analyzes things. And algorithm A, you're told, has 92% performance on identifying lesions. And algorithm B that you're currently using only has 79% performance. So you should really get this algorithm A because it'll make you so much better and so much more efficient. Well, the problem in this situation is that this is using what's known as the dice similarity coefficient. It's a common computer vision metric, and this has some problems. So what you see here in the purple is the reference. There are three structures that you're trying to identify. Algorithm A, which has that 92% performance, does really well at identifying the big lesion, but totally misses the two small ones. Algorithm B, maybe not so perfect on that big lesion, but finds all three lesions. So depending on what your clinical goals are, you may want to consider whether this type of metric is the most appropriate for what you're trying to accomplish. And so therefore, it becomes important to understand the terminology around what are the metrics being used in artificial intelligence. And you can actually go to this paper uh, that was recently published in Nature Methods that goes through some of the pitfalls of the common AI metrics. And that shifts us to, well, why is it that we're talking about AI so much these days? Well, things like large language models have just completely exploded. And just to very basically cover how these work, it has, takes a raw input in text like this, take me out, it tokenizes them or breaks them down, encodes the position of each of these tokens, and then runs them through a series of deep learning networks to predict what the next output may be. It's really important, though, to understand that these models do not inherently know anything. This is simply probabilistic modeling. This is what's underlying that in sort of a very basic form, what's underlying these predictions. It's basically playing a fancy game of statistics with us just really, really effectively. So just keep that in mind as we continue to encounter these technologies. And it becomes so important then to become AI literate through webinars like this that the SSAT is holding because it's becoming more important for clinicians and patients who are at the end user stage of these technologies or are part of appraising these technologies um, before they launch. And so it's really important to try to get a sense of what is your own AI literacy and what knowledge are you bringing into this so that you can appropriately do that evaluation. And so really quickly, just to close, it's really important to identify the net metrics that need to be appropriate for the clinical problem that you have at hand. And you're going to hear about a lot of really great examples in the next hour. And understand that AI is nothing but a tool. It's a tool for complex data analysis. And so you've got to understand the type of problem you're trying to address to select the right tool. And bringing all this together, it's building up your AI literacy so that you as a clinician can ensure that you're implementing these tools appropriately in the care of your patients. Thank you very much. Great, Dan, thank you so much. 
So we are going to move on to our next speaker then. I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Amber Shatta. Dr. Shatta is an advanced endoscopic and laparoscopic GI surgeon. She specializes in minimally invasive techniques for esophageal and gastric disorders, abdominal wall hernias, and gallbladder disorders. She also has special expertise in advanced endoscopic surgery. And she's going to speak to us on revolution of endoscopy with AI. Dr. Shatta, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I want to thank SSAT, Dr. Keller, Dr. Katon for the opportunity to talk. I'm going to just get my slideshow rolling. Okay, you see me? So I'm going to talk today about the revolution of endoscopy with AI. Um, I'm going to talk today about how AI is affecting the gastroenterology practice and how this integration is impacting tool diagnostics. I'm going to give you a few definitions. Um, Dr. Hashimoto laid it out more elegantly than me, uh, but CAD-E, computer-aided detection, basically the ability of your AI to say, is this a lesion? Yes or no. CAD-X, the ability um, then to say, for example, is this cancer? Yes or no. Um, Computer-aided quality assurance is something I'll touch on, basically using AI to determine performance metrics and then uh, analytics. So how can we use AI to take some of the administrative burden out of our lives? Shadow, uh, we're just having a little problem sharing your slides. Okay, sorry. Here, let me see what you got. Oh, I haven't. Sh oh my gosh. Okay. Now, let me get. Sorry, y'all. It's a teaser. Yeah, right. Come on. Here? Perfect. Okay, my apologies. So, just stop here for one moment and give you my definition slide again. Computer-aided detection, simple as saying, is there something there? Yes, no. Can't Computer-aided diagnosis, is this, for example, cancer, yes or no? There can be a lot of diagnosis things. Um, Computer-aided quality assurance, basically how well are we doing at endoscopy? Uh, AI-assisted analytics, so helping using AI to, for example, get rid of some of the administrative burden of um, notes and follow-up. Um, this is all done mostly under the umbrella of uh, deep neural networks, specifically convolutional neural networks, which um, are focused on analyzing pictures and videos. So they're very well suited to endoscopy uh, outputs. Okay, what are we trying to solve? Well, from an endoscopy perspective, colorectal cancer, esophageal cancer, gastric cancer are all things that are diagnosed and surveyed with endoscopy. And so it is the space where we can intervene on um, endoscopic diseases. EGD related AI, I'm gonna talk a little about cancer detection, pre-cancer detection, and then some depth of invasion work and a little bit on disease diagnosis. For col col uh, colon, talk about polyp detection classification, a little less about disease diagnosis, although that AI exists. And then in the small bowel, mostly capsule endoscopy based uh, studies with AI, and I will not touch on that today. I'm gonna start with uh, focus on upper endoscopy and how AI is used. So where does endoscopy fall short? The rate of missing, for example, Barrett's esophagus on a routine screening endoscopy can be significant, 20 to 40%. The rate of missing gastric cancers, especially small gastric cancers, uh, is even higher than that. And I'll give you some data to support that AI um, may exceed the performance of endoscopists alone in visual interpretation of many diseases of the upper GI tract. For example, AI-assisted diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. This is a study recently published that looked at performance by expert endoscopists and the accuracy of diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. It then used an uh, AI algorithm trained on Barrett's esophagus and was able to bring accuracy up in both the expert endoscopist group, up perhaps even a little more in the novice endoscopy group. Um, interestingly, it was not clinically or statistically significant rather, but the rate of AI alone and accuracy of um, diagnosis was uh, perhaps better than either, even with uh, endoscopy, an endoscopist. 
So their conclusion was that standalone AI is comparable to expert performance and AI is disproportionately beneficial to non-experts. So uh, perhaps a democratizing platform. Detecting neoplasia in patients with Barrett's is similarly challenging and AI uh, performs on par with endoscopists. The interesting part is the AI performs faster, which I'm sure none of you are surprised by, and faster by a great degree. This is looking at still photos, not video, th this study. AI can help figure out the depth of invasion in early squamous cell cancer with uh, accuracy that's on par with endoscopist performance. This can perhaps dictate treatment of squamous cell esophageal cancer. AI can assist in detecting early gastric cancer at rates that are comparable to both endoscopists alone as well as endoscopists who are using AI concurrently. Diagnosing H. pylori infection status, whether or not the uh, patient has been cured successfully. Again, AI is comparable to an endoscopist in performance and accuracy, and again, faster. There have been studies that look at performance of an appropriate EGD, what views need to be captured, uh, for example, and there is AI available that can identify those views in real time and capture appropriate images. There's also vision algorithms that can put bounding boxes around things that have been trained, the network has been trained to find as abnormal in this example. It's detecting a neoplastic lesion with a red bounding box and indicating this should get biopsied. In this example, it's giving a blue bounding box to another lesion, but uh, assuring the endoscopist that, that this is likely benign. So the idea is that we can standardize practice, we can decrease endoscopic workload of providers and then assist in decision-making uh, on lesions in real time. This is a study that used AI to generate endos endoscopy reports. So uh, the endoscopy procedure was performed. Landmarks were captured with photographs by AI with an accuracy of 93%. Abnormalities were captured with an even greater uh, accuracy. And then the algorithm was able to take the data it uh, gathered by photos and put it into report form and be able to um, give reports on the lesions and what they were um, with a time, if you look in the left or right lower box, with a time that was faster than a conventional reporting system by almost half. Automating the surveillance of the medical record and trying to figure out what to do next for surveillance of a patient. So this is a natural language processing model that was used to analyze endoscopy reports and pathology reports independently, come up with matching those reports for per patient and then coming up with an appropriate screening interval for gastric cancer with an accuracy that was near 100% for identifying a patient and providing a follow-up plan. Segmentation, Dr. Hashimoto touched on, but in laparoscopic cholecystectomy, there's been quite a lot of work on segmentation. This is my only therapeutic endoscopy slide, but I couldn't resist showing you what's been done in the AI space with segmentation in third space endoscopy to identify, for example, blood vessels during POEM. We're gonna to turn to colonoscopy for a few minutes, talk about polyps primarily. Uh, colonoscopy falls short uh, in many ways, but I'm going to focus on adenoma detection rate. So adenoma detection rate is the percentages of colonoscopies where an adenoma is detected. Um, the standard benchmark is 25%, but we know at least 50% of colons over the age of 50 have an adenoma uh, on autopsy. The higher adenoma detection rate leads to fewer missed uh, colorectal cancers, and so it's used as an indicator of quality of colonoscopy. And it's variable between endoscopists, but also variable within an endoscopist performance, depending on the time of day. So there is some ability for AI to sort of, because AI works the same 24 seven to help us do better. So this is a video looking at a colonoscopy. It has AI enabled uh, vision detection, which is showing us yellow boxes when it sees a lesion of interest. There's also an alarm that sounds. And then the endoscopist can zero in on the lesion and decide whether or not to biopsy. So it has improved detection of polyps. It can predict pathology of polyps, can improve um, the 
optical biopsy where there's no need to take specimens if the it's a non-neoplastic polyp, which can then reduce costs. So this is a meta-analysis looking at detection of colon polyps during colonoscopy. It looked at 21 randomized control trials using AI and found that there was a 24% increase in adenoma detection rate. So it went from 36 to 44% in this group of expert and uh, colonoscopists. The time needed to do colonoscopy did increase a modest amount, but it was less than 30 seconds per colonoscopy when you use AI. AI can predict the pathology of polyps. So you can see here a program that's designed to show you is something an adenoma, not an adenoma, or they cannot tell. Um, this can do uh, detection with an accuracy that is perhaps imperfect, but is um, better and um, is better with an endoscopist than an, uh, with AI alone. So this is a recent study. This is a second recent study looking at both optical diagnosis. This focuses on non-neoplastic polyps. So what is the accuracy of providing a diagnosis without pathology, right? And again, we have a, a accuracy on par with an endoscopist. Is AI cost effective? This is a hypothetical study looking at a hundred thousand um, uh, patient population cohort, the cost to survey and to treat colon cancer in that cohort, and found that compared with no screening, screening um, at all led to a 44% reduction. Compared with no screening, screening with AI led to a 48% reduction in cancer incidence. So this actually led to a reduction in cost if you use AI of $57 per person or in the US, a $290 million per year savings. Similar studies in Canada showed similar results. Um, again, if you're looking at performance of endoscopy and how to reduce cost, maybe you don't remove all of those polyps that are non-neoplastic by AI. So this is a study that modeled resecting all polyp strategy, that's the blue column, diagnosing and leaving polyps that are benign um, by the algorithm and a savings of $125 per endoscopy. If you use AI, you diagnose these uh, non-neoplastic polyps and leave them in place. It would lead to then a savings of 85 million a year in the US. I'm gonna skip that slide and just move on to tell you that there, obviously this sounds amazing, but uh, I'd like you to, to take this with caution. Um, the quality of the system used varies. And obviously the training of the neural network is gonna dictate how good the algorithm is at detecting the lesion you need. So the clinical applicability depends on how well the algorithm is trained on the disease you want to find. Um, we cannot use AI on polyps that we cannot see, so outside of the endoscopic field. We don't get any reimbursement for the use of AI, so the costs that I give you that are exciting are unrealized. And then there's obviously medical legal implications of doing procedures where AI is making determinations and endoscopists are not. So if nothing else uh, makes you happy, I don't think our jobs are at stake just yet because can't sue AI. So in summary, AI is a disruptor of GI practice. It improves the quality and efficiency of diagnostic endoscopy and the role of AI in interventional endoscopy we don't have firmly established as much, but it's definitely exciting. Thank you so much for your time. Sorry for the early issues with getting my talk across. Thank you. Thank you to both the speakers. That was very informative and nice to see the data. There's so much that's being published out there, hard to keep up. Uh, without further ado, so we have next uh, Dr. Wallace. Professor Wallace is a world-renowned gastroenterologist. He has served multiple roles for international GI societies such as the AGA, ASGE, and ACG, and has been an associate editor for gastroenterology and editor-in-chief for GI endoscopy. His main clinical and research interest is on how we can get detect GI cancers at the earliest, most curable form. He has recently returned back to Mayo after a short stance at Sheikh Shabud Medical City in Abu Dhabi as the Chief of Gastroenterology. He will be discussing the utility of AI algorithms and radiomics in pancreatic pathology. Thank you. Good, uh, thank you, Dr. Katan. It's my pleasure to join this uh, esteemed group. Um, uh, 
Uh, just as an aside, I have uh, really appreciate the previous speaker's uh, overview. I've been quite uh, integrally involved in uh, the development of some of the AI tools for colonoscopy, but I'll focus today on our other main interest, which is developing AI tools for early pancreatic cancer detection. Just broadly speaking, you've heard from both of the first two speakers <clears throat> about some of the computer vision applications for endoscopic lesion detection. Uh, radiology is probably the foremost application that's in practice right now. There are systems already in use for many common imaging, particularly things like mammography, where there are very high volumes, um, often with a low prevalence rate of disease. Uh, you've heard also about end automatic endoscopic uh, uh, procedure uh, reports. These are time savers, not necessarily quality improvers, but certainly time savers. And even things like measuring quality performance, like bowel prep scores. I do want to add two other topics uh, to my sec section on generative AI. You've all heard about ChatGPT, but it has many medical applications, including creating common procedural documents. Uh, some of those, uh, whenever you're asked, you know, can you create a standard operating procedure for bowel preparation, uh, other procedures? This is a huge time saver. And the last one is one called ambient clinical intelligence. The more devices we have that monitor things, classically EKGs, rhythm strips, um, uh, uh, your a rhythm monitor in an ICU setting, but increasingly your smartwatches, other glucose monitors, these generate massive amounts of data that are beyond what a physician or anybody could process. And we're increasingly using AI tools to process that information. Even one I'll highlight at the very end, uh, one of my favorite applications as a gastroenterologist. In terms of pancreatic cancer, we're all very well aware of the dismal statistics, uh, the five-year survival, even for very early stage, is not great. It's one of the worst overall uh, uh, prognostic tumors to have. Um, and unfortunately, almost all cancers, almost 90% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed at an untreatable uh, advanced stage. So a major focus of AI is to fulfill this need. How do we diagnose pancreatic cancer at a more early, surgically resectable or curable stage? I'll focus mostly on uh, cross-sectional imaging, but there is some literature on endoscopic ultrasound. As you know, EUS is increasingly used or has always been used as a main modality for tissue confirmation, but it's also being used for screening high-risk individuals, people with a strong family history or known genetic mutation, and in patients who have a background of, for example, hereditary chronic pancreatitis. And in these cases, it can be difficult to distinguish pseudotumors, uh, even autoimmune pancreatitis from true tumors. So there is a literature, it's not as mature as the colonoscopy field, but distinguishing uh, um, chronic, <coughs> chronic pancreatitis, normal pancreas and pancreatic cancer. Most of this data is displayed in the form of these area under the receiver operating characteristic or AUROC. Uh, it essentially measures the performance of the sensitivity weight against the specificity as you change some threshold. You can set your threshold very low where everything's positive. You have a high sensitivity, but a low specificity. Or you can set your threshold higher where your sensitivity is low, but your specificity is high. And this just maps that um, trade-off. A perfect test has a, a overall area under this curve of 1.0 because it, the curve is in the high left corner. That would correspond to a sensitivity and specificity of 100%. Um, so you can see in this case, Endoscopic ultrasound using this system has quite a good area under the ROC curve. Anything over 0.8 is considered quite good. So in this case, 0.92 to 0.94 is really excellent uh, area under the ROC curve. It has not replaced the need for biopsy, but I think the application here would be where you've had a subtle lesion, perhaps in the background of chronic pancreatitis, or a very subtle a small lesion in a, in a patient with familial pancreatic cancer. The main focus of our work and many other groups is using cross-sectional imaging. Uh, MRI is the current approved methodology for screening for pancreatic cancer. But as we all know, CT scans are done in over half of all Americans get a CT scan on a regular basis, often for other incidental reasons. And it's often that those uh, lesions are detected incidentally uh, that CT scan in the emergency department for suspected appendicitis or gallbladder issues, but happens to see a preneoplastic cyst on their pancreas. 
can we use AI tools to better alert radiologists and other providers that there's something suspicious that warrants further attention? We've done a lot of work in our group on training these tools to detect cystic lesions and to classify, so the CAD-X um, modality to classify low-grade pancreatic cysts from high-grade pancreatic cysts. This is the area under the receiver operating characteristic compared to our expert radiologist at Mayo Clinic. I know we all have expert radiologists, but in a small community hospital or in developing countries, they don't necessarily have an expert radiologist reading all of these scans. So in this case, this uh, AI algorithm was equivalent to our expert radiologist at Mayo, so presumably a fairly good quality radiologist. Um, and so this allows this software algorithm to read it. And again, this takes seconds for the software algorithms to read this versus often 15 to 20 minutes to read. You know, it's now almost 4,000 images on a, uh, a multimodal uh, MRI scan. Uh, some of the most interesting work that I find in this field is the ability to detect uh, what has otherwise been a missed pancreatic lesion. There are two studies that I'm going to show here, both of them led by uh, Professor Ajit Gunka at Mayo Clinic. These are the patients that you see in tumor board with a pancreatic cancer, but you realize that they had a scan for some other reason a few years ago. And we often go back and look at that scan to see, was there something that we missed? And that's exactly what he did here. He took Hundreds, hundreds of patients who had a known pancreatic cancer who happened to have had incidental imaging in the years prior to their clinical diagnosis. And he went back to that pre-diagnostic uh, image to see if he could train an algorithm to detect what was not detected at that original early image. <clears throat> you can see here, he had about 155 patients in this pre-diagnostic cohort. He brought in some normal controls, 260 some patients, that were known not to have or develop pancreatic cancer in the future. And then he trained an algorithm to say, could there be something on that pre-diagnostic image? And the area under the ROC curve is extremely high here, 0.95, you can perhaps see in the lower left corner. So the algorithm is detecting things that were not seen by radiologists. When he asked the radiologist to reread the films to say, do you detect something here, knowing that he threw in a mix of blinded normal scans, the area for the, the AOC, AUC for the radiologist was only 0.66 versus the AI model, which was 0.95 to 0.98. And the radiologist had a lot of false positives versus very, very few false positives um, for the AI algorithm. This was then further updated. A second study, actually, I, I eliminated it for uh, time purposes here, but confirming this in a cohort about 10 times larger. This is some work that our team has done Again, taking advantage of the fact that there are subtle clinical clues that we often overlook. We all know patients with pancreatic cancer and other cancers start to lose weight and develop diabetes about three years prior to their clinical diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. So we developed an algorithm to classify uh, changes in body composition, fat distribution, both subcutaneous and visceral, uh, also cholesterol distribution. It turns out their cholesterol starts to drop off. And so we've been able to quantify and importantly do this on a scale that takes seconds to read any CT scan to see if a patient is starting to have changes in their visceral fat. You can see that precedes by about three years a clinical diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, whether it's visceral fat or subcutaneous fat. Um, this is how we quantified it. We developed an algorithm that, again, does not take a radiologist to circle the fat areas in these scans. This is all automated now, and it provides a quantification of parameters that we normally don't measure on cross-sectional imaging unless we're specifically looking, you know, perhaps in a bariatrics practice, but in this case, developing another biomarker that can be uh, automated through AI tools. One of the tricks behind a lot of this is a very hard technical problem to solve, which is what's called segmentation. If you want to develop an AI algorithm for any organ, you need to first separate that organ within the scan. And in this case, the pancreas has a very irregular shape. It's surrounded by bowel and liver, uh, bone and muscle. And all AI algorithms to date use manual segmentation, which is extremely time consuming and not scalable. You can't just put the software in your, the CT scan in your emergency department and ask it to first segment the pancreas and then run the algorithm. 
So we've been working for several years and fortunately have just had some recent breakthroughs with this where we can automatically segment every organ in the body and then develop the AI algorithm just specifically for that organ. So you can run the pancreas algorithm on the pancreas segmented image. You can run a liver algorithm on the liver. And all of this is, is uh, scalable and automated. Some of the challenges we face now are, how do we use this information? Currently, I can run these algorithms on our 10 million medical records here at Mayo Clinic and identify which patients are at increased risk of having pancreatic cancer in the next three years. We're now just pushing the boundary of how do you inform a patient about this? How do you inform their doctor? You call them up and say, our AI algorithm says that you're very likely to get pancreatic cancer in two and a half years from now. Um, and they have to trust you uh, and say, yes, I'll have a, a screening MRI scan. So we need to develop some issues, uh, some tools to inform patients, create alerts, for both patients and physicians around this information. Obviously patients, some of them might, might be quite shocked that we've run these uh, algorithms passively on their medical record when they didn't approach us asking about specific risks. So to summarize, we're seeing a very rapid transformation of multiple fields in, in medicine in general and very specifically in GI. We now have FDA uh, approved applications such as the colon polyp detectors. I use that every single day in my practice. Um, we have preliminary work that looks quite promising on pancreatic cancer. We have other work where we need to develop automatic workflows to passively monitor, for example, those CT scans done in the emergency room, the metabolomics, their fat distribution or their cholesterol. And we need to identify how to properly inform these patients. I'll stop there and thank you all. This is a beautiful picture from Abu Dhabi. As Dr. Kaitan mentioned, I've just returned to the United States uh, where I was a, a, a colleague of hers at Sheikh Shakbud Medical Center. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wallace. That was great. Next, um, without further ado, our last speaker is Dr. Shahrukh Hashmi. Dr. Hashmi is yet another world-renowned oncologist who studies cancer survivorship and late effects of blood and marrow transplantation. Over the past several years, Dr. Hashmi has transformed oncology by integrating AI and IoT, or Internet of Things, into practice. After serving at SSMC as the Director of Medical Research in Abu Dhabi, he was recently promoted to be the Director of Research Development at the Department of Health in Abu Dhabi. You will talk about concept of Internet of Things and our future today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's uh, great to be here in this uh, great forum. And uh, I hope you can hear me. And uh, unless uh, told otherwise, I will continue uh, my slides. Yes. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about IOMTs or IOTs, which are called um, in general, those are Internet of Things, uh, which is basically uh, as a base, a basic intro, um, our variable devices, which are connected uh, with each other, as well as with internet uh, to a central monitoring area. The interconnection via the internet of computer, computing devices embedded in everyday objects, enabling them to send and receive any kind of data is a basic definition of an IoT. And uh, there's a lot of IoTs around us, as you can see, every everyday use, we've been using those uh, for quite some time, for more than a decade at least. The Internet of Medical Things is inclusive of biosensors, variables, connected health devices to the different remote villages, for example, and within the cities, as well as many, many other areas. And this field continues to increase over time as the technology to develop the biosensors and nanoreceptors continues to increase. The, the main issues here and the main, sorry, main uses here um, are something that Dr. Wallace just introduced was the ambient uh, clinical intelligence. That's part of it actually, um, is actually the remote health monitoring, um, which is the most common current use of um, the ambient clinical intelligence, which is basically the the Fitbit and the Apple Watches and CGMs um, and many, many other applications which are currently approved uh, by different regulatory agencies in the US, which is FDA, uh, 
EMA in Europe and many other uh, uh, regulatory agencies in the world. CGM is a continuous glucose monitoring. We've been using, uh, for example, Libra and many other systems by many, many different companies uh, which are approved for clinical use and the transmit uh, live data uh, to a, a central repository, for example, or to the hospital or to the um, patient himself or herself depending on the AI software that's being used. It's also used for the emergency notification systems. Many of the current um, ER systems um, can track many different healthcare events. For example, fall in elderly uh, myocardial infarctions, or right now, a lot of these IOTs are being developed um, for disaster management and emergency preparedness, uh, including pandemics and natural disasters, for example, earthquakes and other things. Um, the, um, the IoT pathways uh, typically um, uh, have a continuous um, flow of data that starts with the variable device, which has a very sophisticated sensor. These sensor could be nanoreceptors, could be a light sensor, could be electromagnetic sensor, could be a uh, uh, something we call PPG, for example, for oxygen monitoring um, that can actually process the data um, via machine learning or deep learning algorithm that Dr. Hashimoto had introduced. Um, uh, the patient-related data combined with the data that's coming up from the device is uh, used, um, is transmitted uh, through a secure channel. Uh, this is over internet, typically 5G network, but right now the 6G network, which is coming up with, um, with uh, uh, which are much, much faster, probably um, anywhere from 10 to 200 times faster than the current 5G networks is being rolled out in many countries right now, for example, in UA and Korea and many other countries which are doing end-to-end -end 6G network at the moment as we speak. Um, the next uh, step is... Uh, data processing, um, and then data review by healthcare providers, and then clinical outcome decisions. We published this paper, this um, uh, figure comes from a paper we published three years ago, when we're talking about uh, IOTs and how they're transforming, or they will transform in the future, the overall care uh, by telemedicine, telehealth, and oncology. We published another paper uh, recently um, on, on the cardiology network uh, which could be really enhanced by the use of IOTs and artificial intelligence, especially for the poor countries, actually, where the access to a really specialized care is, is absent or nearly absent. For example, there's no, in the field of GI, you don't have world-class endoscopist or specialist to do EUS in many, many cities. Actually, majority of the world, if you talk about 200 countries, an 8 billion population do not have access to gastroenterologists who do EUS. But can you do something which, which can uh, help in decision-making to triage those patients, which patients need to come to a big city for a while, which the answer is yes, if, if we put in technology which is cost-effective um, and, and, and can be transferred uh, in a secure environment. The, um, this figure just shows a general outline of the um, current um, devices, but also how the rep repositories work. Um, there are rules, as we have rules in computer engineering that Dr. Hashimoto showed initially. Um, and there's typically a, a, a secure cloud. We're not that sophisticated yet to merge the different clouds of different countries for telehealth internationally. Um, but those are developing in a so sovereign cloud that we call at the moment, um, and it's uh, probably gonna be very helpful in the future, but the management tools are numerous, um, so many that I cannot enlist. And in 10 minutes, I just wanna make sure that I can weigh the message of the basics of the uh, internet of things um, that, are, that will be used and are currently being used. The security, um, there are questions that are arising as all of us know that the attack on the hospital systems and uh, the clinics and the uh, where is healthcare data is increasing significantly over time and all kinds of attacks are increasing. Um, and um, 
because the patient medical records are uh, much more than a gold mine. In fact, the per value patient medical record is more than credit card theft at the moment in black market. Um, one of the studies in the US actually had shown the vulnerabilities in the medical device security. And 53% um, and of them were found to have critical um, elements which need, which need improvement. And healthcare organizations with more connected devices, for example, they've got an IoT center. And many hospitals now are, and smart hospital designs actually are having the IoT center, which is basically a, a two big screens. These are very special monitors or, or 10 screens or, or big or larger number, depending on the size, are getting data 24 uh, seven from thousands or more patients uh, of all kinds of data, whether it's glucose, oxygen, uh, rehab, for example, fasciculations, fibrillations, um, or, or oxygen, or post ICU state, um, state data. A lot of them are filtered by AI, uh, but then there's manual um, uh, people, actually nurses or, or physicians or te technicians sitting actually in the IoT center, uh, really looking at the alarms that go off. And uh, But this medical device security remains a current issue, which is being refined and redefined. Um, as you know, that the IOTs, as I showed you, the Apple Watch study from Stanford was published in the Journal of Medicine 2019. Um, and it has different modes, as, as you know, and Fitbit and many, many other watches, um, as you know, have um, various softwares. And the reg regulators approve different softwares depending on the approval seeked actually. So some of them may have the, the data that um, is sufficient for a patient to be concerned about, but some of them have true medical data that can be transmitted over live actually to a, a particular hospital or healthcare system. And that's why we have many IOTs currently approved for healthcare. I can, and it's on the US FDA website and the and the US FDA department uh, that actually deals with this is actually the, the device department. We've got the biologics and the and many, many other departments in the US FDA. But um, the CEDAR um, really takes care of uh, many of the advanced technologies that come up in uh, both the AI softwares and currently many different AI softwares are approved. Um, I can tell you that at least 880 AI softwares are approved. Um, uh, by the US FDA and more than 500 are approved by EMA in Europe, out of which a uh, majority of them um, um, have deep learning algorithms for computer vision mainly, but a lot of them are, are really integrated within devices. Uh, this is just to show you what I just mentioned. Um, some of the uh, AI enabled medical devices, as you can see here, um, and you can go on the website and you can look at the actual approval for those devices, um, which are currently being used clinically, not on R&D, because it's a lot of R&D behind it that you uh, saw. The EU approvals and USA approvals continue to increase over time. It's an older slide, but in, in, in Europe, we need a CE mark. In US, we need a FDA approval for a device. Uh, typically, as, as most of you who deal with devices, it's a class one, two, and three devices. Class 2B and Class 3 require uh, clinical trials or, or equivalent studies, 510K or PMA pathway that most of you are familiar with. Um, so where are we going? Uh, let me just sum up. Um, the virtual reality and chatbots are playing a huge role in psychology rehab and pain management. A lot of these advanced IOTs are being developed um, with the softwares together. These softwares are very sophisticated AI algos, which um, can, um, which are being studied uh, for helping various diseases. I show you uh, in the middle picture, the, um, one of the IOTs called IT bra. I mean, um, one of the challenges in cancers is they're very vascular and hot. Um, so how do you detect them early? And the IT bras have nanoreceptors that look like normal bras. They actually um, can transmit all the data of a tumor, which is irregular shaped because, you know, it's irregular shaped. It's typically not a lipoma. Or, or a benign tumor is cancerous, um, but also temperature changes, it can um, really um, transmit the signals. And one day, um, if somebody's wearing a bra for like one hour a month, even the, the data can transmit and say there's a problem and there's a lump. Um, and this is, this studies, uh, these kind of studies in breast cancer started a long time ago, actually. 
a few years ago, and now they're maturing the, and seeking uh, approval. Um, the pathway is complex, but uh, just to let you know that we are we are actually embarking on many different um, R and D uh, sensors, which are going to be transferred over to um, a hybrid AI modeled. Um, compliant uh, system for detection of cancers, um, aware of different cancers, but also in practically all the fields, including uh, GI, surgery, neurosurgery, uh, rehab, depression, and uh, et cetera. But there's a process from QMS design, which should be environmental conditions, uh, should be addressed, electric responsibilities, cybersecurity, um, and this AI software is, you don't need to go through the slides, but just to let you know that there is a lot of fundamental regulatory principles that we go through when we design these clinical trials. And lastly, I want to show you, identify the clinical need, how to actually go from clinical need to get the, um, from bench to bedside, device development, and AI software development go hand in hand um, in many areas. Um, you need to identify the product, including biosensors. You know, Philips um, from Netherlands is a, is a truly healthcare company now, transformed completely into healthcare. GE, Siemens, you name it. Many other companies are big, big players, but small companies also are playing a big role. Um, you, you have to talk with the companies or the, and the regulators ahead of time or develop the things yourself in the uni and get the research done, pilot validate and publish. With that, I'm going to end and give it back to Dr. Pooja. Thank you so much for having me. Great talk. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Thank Pooja, you. Thank you to all the speakers. Yeah, amazing talks. Thanks to all the speakers. Should we open up to questions? While we wait for somebody to uh, ask a question, um, I wanted to ask any idea or any data about overdiagnoses, like the false positives. Do we have any data or statistics that tells us what's the unmeasured cost of overdiagnosis at diagnosing patients with AI, like what Dr. Wallace was suggesting, you know, with AI integration in healthcare, do we have any idea about patient anxiety or the extra amount of testing to prove that AI perhaps gave you a false positive result? That's a good question, um, uh, um, uh, Pooja. The, the best data we have actually comes, for example, in pancreatic cancer comes out of the Netherlands. They have a very large um, familial cohort of patients with the CDK N2A mutation that causes the FAM, the familial uh, melanoma that's uh, closely linked with pancreatic cancer risk as well. Um, so they actually have done sociological and psychological testing on patients and their willingness to receive information about you know, AI-assisted um, MRIs, for example, uh, most of the patients in those have been quite favorable in terms of their willingness to undergo um, testing with these methodologies. Um, and even uh, after being informed that they're, like any test, there's false positives and false negatives. But as I showed with the, you know, the, the accuracy in the mid-90% range, those numbers are relatively low. You know, we have a lot of data on other systems that have false positives. For example, Coligard, the stool DNA testing, has a you know five to ten percent false positive rate. You get the colonoscopy and you don't find anything. Um, so patients, I think, are relatively accustomed to the concept of false positive tests. Obviously, it's a tremendous anxiety producer when you're talking about a lethal disease like a very lethal disease like pancreatic cancer. So there's a push to get you know get the definitive testing done very quickly. I think that's a great point about um, real world evidence in the radiology literature. We see a lot of examples where um, they've actually w gone back and looked at the FDA submissions for some of these algorithms where you have performance, which is considered relatively high in the 90 percent. And then they uh, when they run them in the real world, where real world incidence is significantly lower, performance drops in the 70s. And so when you have uh, artificially class balanced data set on which these things are being trained, then it's really hard to predict what the real world performance is going to be. And so I think those real world studies are really, really important. I can, my own experience with the, the AI colonoscopy systems, um, 
you know, you do get a lot of false alerts with those. I'm sure Dr. Shada has used these and uh, these green boxes pop up everywhere where there's a little bubble or a little bit of remnant stool, but you do learn very quickly the difference between a false alert. They tend to be a quick flash of a, a bounding box and then they go away, but it is a factor. You have to coach users. Uh, we had some people say they don't like the system. They're not going to use it because of those false alerts, physicians that, that don't like those false alerts. And an interesting point was brought up about speaking to patients about AI. And I just wanted to quickly ask the panel members, when you use a tool to help with your diagnostic procedures or your therapeutic procedures, do you tell the patients that you're going to be using the AI platform? Yes, Dr. Wallace. We, is we do. So we, you know, the, the system we used was FDA approved and at the time it was approved in the United Arab Emirates. In fact, patients came to us specifically asking for it. They'd heard about it on a local news station. So we actually saw quite a large number of people coming. We would typically inform them that we we're using an AI system. Um, and actually in many of our clinical notes now, it says within the clinical note, even the pathology reports here at Mayo Clinic, it says, uh, you know, pathology report and, you know, uh, includes the use of AI to assist the, the pathologist. So at the moment, we are informing everybody, I think, as it increasingly just becomes part of the background noise uh, when everything is using AI or near everything, uh, it, we probably won't inform people separately that it's being used. Dr. Hashimoto? Yeah, I'm not currently using them in my practice, but patients will come asking if they get their data used to build, since our group builds so many of these devices. Um, and that's actually part of their interest is sort of they want to be part of that, which I think speaks a lot to um, the generosity of patients of wanting to be part of that revolution. Dr. Hashmi? Absolutely. We always tell our patients and patients are quite accepting. We've got um, 200 nationalities here in Abu Dhabi, as uh, Dr. Wallace has practiced here and Dr. Puja does. Um, and uh, we haven't seen any um, any big questions arising. Um who owns the data is a question that regulators are refining those policies of insurance, uh, something that happens. Um, at the end of the day, the patient owns the data if, uh, that's gonna be used in R&D if there is real world evidence data being generated, uh, but who is responsible for, for example, uh, any mistakes or errors that happen, that those policies are also being refined quite a bit. Uh, and each institution signs onto those, any physician signs onto that as well. Um, and those policies, I, we can talk about some other time, but at the moment, it, it is the patient's right to know if an AI device is being used, unless in emergency rooms, a stroke uh, ED, immediately the radiology scans, which are approved, there's many of them, more than 10, uh, for the hemorrhage versus infarct, uh, ischemic infarct, uh, those are emergency procedures. So they, those are done immediately within seconds, the AI software is um, prioritize and separate those out, and then the radiologist verifies if there is a signal. Um, so yeah, the answer is yes, unless it's an emergency. Thank you. Dr. Shada. Yeah, I, I know we're running out of time, but I did want to uh, allow Dr. Welsh has been asking a couple of questions and just to answer him, uh, he had asked about any thoughts on medical staff policies and procedures concerning AI and any malpractice ramifications concerning AI. If anybody, any of the speakers want to take that? Well, I think a lot of those are being set by health systems. And at least here at Penn, we have a huge AI committee that goes into that, involves a lot of lawyers and things as well. Um, it's going to be critically important, right? Because sort of I sort of mentioned some of the aspects around literacy and being able to inform uh, individuals how to use this appropriately and interpret things appropriately. In terms of malpractice, and we don't see clear litigation yet, but at the end of the day, at least in the United States, we know that until that thing hits a courtroom, it's going to be really hard to know what the ramifications are going to be. True. Sure. I think most legal opinions we've received have, have been, you know, as you would expect, these do not re re resolve the physician's responsibility to provide proper care of the patient. There's nothing any of these that says, you know, even a semi-autonomous AI system, uh, uh, most physicians or other care providers have to sign off on any information going on, and they're ultimately responsible for that decision, just like you would be for any other test result.
Great. I think we're over the time limit. I cannot thank the speakers as well as my co-moderator to help us get started. And again, Dr. Uh, thanks, a special thanks to Beverly Henry for arranging this. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.